I'll leave the poll up for maybe one more moment here as Gene and I are sort of getting things kicked off. So if you're just joining us, take the poll. Uh, do you have budget allocated? And what we're trying to figure out is just where people are coming from with out of home in terms of your background and understanding. Because to be honest, like I'm kind of a newbie to this market. When Gene and I first got talking, I was like, there's so much for me to learn. And so when we planned this webinar, I was really excited. And then when we went through <laughs> the slides yesterday, I was just like, this is awesome. Like, I'm, I'm going to learn a lot and have a lot of questions. So um, let's go ahead and jump into this, Gene. Everyone, thank you for being here. Uh, it is AI and out-of-home advertising mar or out-of-home marketing. I am Paul Reitzer. If you're not familiar with the Institute, I am the founder and CEO of Marketing Eye Institute. I had uh, Gene and I go back to our HubSpot days. So my agency, uh, former agency, PR 2020, was HubSpot's first partner back in like 2007. So she and I crossed over for a few years at HubSpot. I, I sold that agency last year, still involved, but uh, most of my time now is spent on Marketing Eye Institute. And Gene, just give us a little bit. I mean, we, again, we could talk about Lego. We could talk about Lola. We could talk about all these amazing <laughs> experiences you have. But what's going yeah. on with you at One Screen and your role there and, and a little well, bit about Well, we're having screen. a lot of fun. You know, uh, it's uh, going to One Screen is a lot like when I first went to HubSpot. It's, uh, you know, you, you have a startup and you're building the team and you're building the forward motion. You're building, you're building everything. Oops, I think I just went forward too much. Um, so you're building a lot of things in, in conjunction. And it's just a lot of fun. I'm lucky enough to work uh, with people like Prashant. Prashant goes back to the HubSpot days as well. Um, this is my fourth time working with Prashant. He's the wind beneath my sails. That's all I can say. He's just amazing. And I'm so lucky to have him on the team. I have Kaylee, who has worked for me in uh, two other companies. This is number three. Um, I just, I, I would just love to hire so many people that I would just love to have as part of the team. Unfortunately, we're all remote and I just miss physically seeing people, but this is a blast. And what I, when I went to HubSpot, I was amazed at, wow, look at all these things. There are all these point solutions under one, one platform. And when I went to one screen, it was like, holy moly's look at all this wonderful information. And I only wish I knew then what I now know, because my conferences and everything would have been so much better. And I know Emily would have had a blast doing some of this out of home creative stuff. I can only imagine what she would have come up with. So that's exciting. Well, it's it's awesome to be back together and to be able to do this with you. So thank you for for being here. And if you want to jump us ahead, just again, I'll take I'm like trying. one. Oh, I'm trying. <laughs> Sorry, you got too many buttons open here. Hold on. There we go. All right. So if you, again, if you're not familiar with the Institute, I, I like to, anytime we have a, a session, a webinar, an event, I, I like to kind of set the stage for what it is we're trying to do. And we are under the working assumption that as marketers, at least 80% of what you do will be AI assisted to some degree in the next few years. And again, think about this like in your daily life where AI is in your Netflix and your Spotify and your Google Maps and your Gmail and Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and all these places that AI just sort of sits and, in, mm -hmm. and creates this personalized and customized convenient experience for you. That's where we believe marketing and business software and solutions are going, that the AI will just be infused into it, but we're not there yet. And so what we're doing at the Institute is trying to make AI approachable and actual and trying to cut through all the terminology and really just give you very specific examples of how you can use it and how you can seek out smarter technology like what one screen's doing. And one of the ways we do it is the webinar series. So there's a bit.ly link there and Kathy can throw it in the chat as well. Uh, Kathy McPhillips, our chief growth officer is with us to uh, lend some hand and help out if you need anything. And so there's a bunch of on-demand webinars there, probably 15 or 20 of them. And then the the last piece that I'll get out of Jean's way to let her do her thing is, <laughs> I think we have our conference slide. There we go. So if you are ready to be in person, ready to do a live event, we are definitely ready for live events. And we are considering our out-of-home strategy around our live event potentially. Um, but we will be in Cleveland August 3rd to the 5th for the Marketing AI Conference. The inaugural was in 2019. 2020 obviously didn't happen. 2021 was virtual, but we will be back live and in person. Um, Gene will be there. One screen will be there. So we would love to see you there if, if you're ready for in-person events like we are. And with that, I'm going to hang out and kind of like jump in around while with Gene, but I'm going to okay. let Gene go. And actually real quick, I'm going to share the results. So we had asked this question up front, do you have budget allocated? 
43% yes, 43% no, 14% not sure. So Jean, that's what you're working with with the audience. Okay. And I'm going to let you take it from there. <laughs> kind of a small crowd, but um, here we go. Do I just... Uh, yeah, go ahead. See. You can just... Okay. Yep. How do I get, I get out of this? Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, just wanted to give you a quick overview of what out of home or outdoor advertising might be. As I said earlier, I didn't know what I didn't know initially when I went to one screen in terms of what outdoor might be. You can consider it real world or some of the things that we see every day that we don't really consider as out of home. I know that I missed a lot of opportunities when I've spent like a million dollars on a booth or something. And But there's so many possibilities for us to be creative, way more creative than anything that we do from digital. I think we can all agree. I mean, I, I think we can all agree that digital marketing is over-optimized right now. Uh, we, we shout about the cost of the CPM of, of Facebook or Google AdWords, which is problematic for us from a budget. And Many marketers, 47% from a survey that we did recently said that they're very concerned that they're gonna be priced out of paid social altogether, that they're just not gonna be able to afford to do it. So what else? Let's, let's talk about the fact that it's over-optimized. Uh, your target prospects really don't wanna hear from you very often. And then some will use some sort of an ad blocker or a VPN. I think I kicked through those a little too fast, but. Um, it's not as easy as it looks, right? These are all things that we're trying to figure out together. And I'm certainly not saying that out of home is easy because let me go into this a little bit further because it's so complicated, way more complicated than running a Facebook program or a Google AdWords program, which are difficult enough on a good day. So we did a survey, just want you to know that we had 611 respondents. Uh, it was totally anonymous. They had no idea that it was a one screen or what the survey was all about. And I feel like we did a pretty good job. We fielded this in February, just a couple of months ago. And what we found is kind of what we expected a little bit. Um, 36 invest in digital video, 30% invest in it, which I thought was a little low, 30% in SEO. I thought everybody invested in SEO, particularly if you have HubSpot or you're thinking that way, right, Paul? Um, <clears throat> I thought 29% in influencer marketing, I thought was pretty interesting. And then 25% uh, invest in programmatic or sponsored content, which would be a lot of syndicated things. But the budget strain is this ongoing strain that we all have from a budget. And I think that many people in Q4, certainly this was my case as well, is the cost of your CPM with Facebook, with your paid social channels, with Google AdWords, could it was almost two and sometimes three X in the quarter. So if you had a budget of say $100,000 and then what would happen to you at that particular time is that you could burn right through that before Black Friday, right? And you just, because of the cost, because who's your competition? Well, at that time it was every e-commerce brand on the planet, every brick and mortar, but brand on the planet. And it didn't matter what the price was, you know, in terms of bidding, it was who's going to make the most money out of this. It's going to be Facebook or Meta. And it's also going to be uh, Google AdWords or any of these uh, specific platforms that you're bidding against for that kind of uh, position. So at the end of the year, you could very well be out of budget. You could be over budget and you could be in deep water deep dark water with your CFO as a result of overspending because <clears throat> every single person on this call knows that your sales team wants leads. And at that time, the only way that you could really look at leads or brand building was by spending more on those specific channels. But what we did learn, which was a good thing, is that we learned that about one third of them are testing out of home. They're looking at it and they're trying to figure out. And it, because with the digital returns so diminished, um, we can, I know that a lot of people are testing out of home right now because our lead flow is absolutely off the charts right now. Um, I kicked in a, a quickie demand gen program when I joined one screen back at the end of September, when Prashant joined and with his team of Kaylee and the rest of the team, the, the demand, the leads are coming in so fast and furious that our sales guy is crying, uncle, uncle, I just can't 
handle any more leads, which I think is a good problem to have. But on the other hand, if people want answers, we want to make sure that we're able to help them as fast as possible. So Prashant is spending a great deal of time trying to figure out some automation on that. So what we're trying to look at in something that we've been really, our team has been able to get a solid response to is that our audiences are simply just tired of digital screens. They're, they're, we're weary of that, not leery, but weary. And the idea of being able to look up, think about looking up, looking up, uh, looking up, and not always looking at a screen all the time. Those are the key considerations that you really want to consider in terms of building your brand or building awareness. And we are working with Madison Square Garden, we're working with Yankee Stadium, we're working with South by Southwest, we're working with all these venues that have a challenge in terms of trying to be able to sell their out of home space because there's limitations to what they can use on those particular screens, but also helping other brands get necessary visibility. Hey, hey Gina, so one thing. Gene, one well, second. So, Michael might have come in late. And again, like the category of half the people don't have out of home budgeted, so it may not even know what we're talking about. Let's take a quick stop for anyone to join us late and give a definition of out of home marketing. So when we're talking about out of home categorically, what's fitting within there and what should we be thinking about as marketers? Because I'm actually, I said at the beginning, but I was where Michael was, you know, until six months ago, I wasn't actually familiar with out of home as a category that as a marketer, I should even be thinking about. And I am an mm -hmm. event organizer and a sponsor and like the exact kind of person that should be knowing <laughs> what it is, but I did not. So let's just take okay. a quick reset on what it is for anybody who joined us late. So I, uh, what we're talking about, uh, we're using out of home to help you to dominate a conference. And I'm going to use some examples specifically. Out of home would be anything from transit to uh, billboards, to bus shelters, to wrapped cars, to uh, LED trucks. We've got a few things to give you as an example, Michael. So got a cool couple of little videos that might give you some cool ideas on things that you could do at events. Um, um, Paul and I both have roughly the same amount of experience and I didn't know anything really about out of home freely admitted that I wish that I had known more. So I could have supported my sales team at the many conferences and user conferences that I have done. So I'm hoping that we'll learn a little bit more. This study is all about learning, um, uh, from uh, an audience of marketers, specifically 611, and what they're planning on doing with their budgets, knowing that digital advertising is hurting right now. It's under budget constraints. It's under uh, it decreased ability to actually get the ROI that you used to get a year ago, two years ago. So I hope that helps answer your question. That's great. Yeah, and I agree. I'm, the, the video is awesome. So yeah, you're going to have a deep understanding in a couple minutes. So we're talking about real world marketing um, in terms of how we relate to potential customers. So this is the concept of being in the real world versus the metaverse, that this is all about real world branding, specifically being able to look, see, touch, understand what's going on in AI helps a great deal because things like taxi toppers, if the weather is changing, you can see some digital billboards that the temperature gets to a certain point and Dunkin' Donuts starts advertising the cold drinks. If it goes below a certain temperature, it starts advertising the hot drinks. And these are all things that use artificial intelligence in a way to be able to inform the messaging uh, with weather, with news, with all sorts of uh, filters that you can take a look at. So let's go into it and let's talk about dominating. Let's talk about dominating your next conference or event with real marketing. So this is a wrapped car. Rapify is one of our par partners. And this is a car and that QR code that is on the car is actually a QR code that will actually take you to the one screen site. I don't know how far back you have to go in, in order to get this, but our friends at Rapify just uh, sent this over to us yesterday. And I really like this quite a bit. But let's let's take a little trip with Scrunchy. Scrunchy was on the car, but let's see what Scrunchy would do when he goes to a conference. The volume up a little bit, Gene, if you can. 
Well, as you know, whenever you go to a conference, you're somewhat limited, Oops, sorry, you're limited somewhat to the conference itself because they're, they'll buy the entire venue. You're trying to sponsor individual things. And even as a silver sponsor, you can maybe get a lunch, you can get a breakfast, you can get this, you can get that. But what we've learned is that 84% of conference attendees go to an event and they're, if they, that person, that company at the event, the brand, the services, the products, the services, they leave with a more positive impression of the exhibitors. So that is a great reason to be able to help reinforce your messaging, not necessarily always tied to the publisher of that particular event, especially when you're a sponsor. Now, I've been a sponsor of a number of events. We're a sponsor of the upcoming Maycon event and we're very excited about it. But talking to Paul, like how do we make sure that we have more visibility? So we're actually working with South by Southwest. Frenchy went to South by Southwest recently. We had this LED truck, which was visual. It had music and it played that video on the side screen and it was parked in Austin so people could see it. Uh, Reprise is a partner of ours. Uh, Reprise is a wonderful software demo package uh, located in Boston and their uh, CMO, Jen Steele, looked at going to the B2B marketing exchange event in Scottsdale and wanted to have more visibility. Note the QR code that she has on that. She, at that particular event, I think they spent around $20,000 for the three-day event. They did um, the rideshare videos in the, the rideshare units. They did some taxi toppers. They did this LED truck. And what they looked like, people were going to the booth and they recognized, oh, that's you. That's you, Reprise. And they went to the booth and they understood that they they looked big. <laughs> the company looked big because they were, were seeing being seen everywhere. And I have some other video to be able to show you what because they were also at the baggage claim area. But I wanted to show you this one from Metadata IO. Hopefully this will here we go. Another LED truck. This is music is playing from the truck. The video is in the truck. So it's so funny, Gene, real quick. The, the one thing I think yeah. about is like early in my career, I worked in sponsorship um, mm -hmm. through an agency. And what we would call it was just activations. Like we're already going to be there. We're going to be spending 20, 30,000 to be a sponsor. Like how do we activate the sponsorship? Not knowing that there was a categorical name for what we were doing. We just talked about activating it. And this is the kind of stuff that didn't really exist back then. But now that I'm, again, event organizer and a sponsor, I I'm like seeing this stuff thing. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so many ways you could go further when you're already going to be present. Exactly. And this is the kind of thing that I like to say, and a number of us say at one screen is, do you ever take a picture with your Facebook ad or your Google AdWord? Do you ever send that to your parents and say, hey, mom, look at me, I made it. But these kinds of trucks and this type of outdoor real world advertising, it is a look mile we've made it kind of a moment. And it's a lot of fun to be able to share socially. It's great for the company because it increases the brand footing, brand building, which is pretty exciting for everybody. So thank you. And yes, absolutely. Uh, extending your conference presence and the actual engagement. So let me go to the next slide. And all we're trying to do for you right now is we're just trying to point the way. Paul wanted to be able to talk about out of home. We, we talked about it together a little bit about what it means, but he said, so what, what does it take? Well, it out of home doesn't appear and then dis disappear. It also doesn't track you. So it does, it's not like, you know, we all have the, the retargeting on our Google AdWords or any type of e-commerce play that you use, you always have that. But this offline medium uh, in terms of driving online activity, we can prove that it's 4X. We can also prove that out of home can deliver better results than Facebook ads. We have a, a, a 
playbook on that specifically of which we've had hundreds of downloads on that, that we did this ourselves. Now this wasn't done by me, it was done by Tim Rowe, uh, who is an excellent category builder and really understands things. But Paul said, what, what can you do? How can you talk about this? You know, what, give me the questions. How can someone start to think about out of home? And so this is what out of home looks like in the Luma landscape, the Luma way of looking at things. And the challenges in out of home, unlike when you're dealing with Facebook or Google ads and you're able to day part and bid and do all those types of campaigns with different people, what you're dealing with is probably a hundred different types of real world advertising. I know I said things like blimps and uh, airplane banners and all these different kinds, pizza boxes. There's another one, wrapped ice cream trucks, all those types of things. And they're all these different suppliers. So let's say there's a hundred different forms of media. And then there's 10,000, 10,000 different suppliers. If I wanted to advertise out of home in the Boston marketplace, I'd have to go to 60 different vendors. It's almost impossible as a marketing person, you don't have the bandwidth to go out and do RFPs with 60 different vendors. It's, it's impossible. So what we do at one screen is we establish your goals. We figure out what you want to spend. So your goals could be brand building, it could be vanity, it could be supporting a conference, it could be lead generation, it could be web traffic, all of which have different ways to be able to use the different types of outdoor or real world advertising to be able to drive the necessary traffic. So one of the things we look at is in much the same way that you have to spend $100,000 before you really get traction with Facebook, you can't spend $5,000. Can you spend $5,000? Sure, you can, but don't expect it to increase your brand or increase your visibility. That's not gonna work for you. You really wanna look at a longer term campaign and it doesn't mean that you do the big giant splash. You're, you're looking for a longer term play. You want to have some realistic expectations about what it's gonna do for you. Um, you're likely to look and test various types of campaigns. So this is kind of like what we look at that you have a decent budget that you're not looking for a one and done. You may be looking at a takeover of a city in conjunction with a series A announcement. Things like that are really exciting when people wanna be on the NASDAQ tower in Times Square as an example. So, AI <clears throat> reprise, getting back to reprise, this is, this is a cool example. They had a Series A announcement and they wanted to do a takeover in San Francisco, Boston and Midtown Manhattan. Well, why those three cities? Well, they gave us a list of 1500 targeted accounts that they were targeting with ABM. They gave us those, we overlaid it with all the, the the points of interest in the United States and the most accounts happened in San Francisco, Boston and Midtown Manhattan. And then in turn, we overlaid where those companies were so that we could buy the right spaces for them for maximum visibility, maximum impressions for them. And this was all done. And I have this further into the slides to be able to talk about how we were able to get the right kind of traction for them. In the space of four days, they had 4X the number of demos that they had ever had in a standard week. They use HubSpot. So we were able to look at those metrics. Their um, visits to the website were up 2000%. They just had more people going to getreprise.com to look at it. To They're building this brand awareness. This is, this is the whole point of this is who's reprise and what are they? And I know everybody's gonna say it's supposed to be reprise. Yes. But I asked Jen Steele, who's their CMO, and they said, we settled on reprise. So go with me on this. This is what Jen said, go with me. So reprise. So this is, you can figure out how many cars are going, how many vehicles, not just cars, going by a specific billboard through the use of AI. And this is important because you're trying to maximize the amount of impressions you have. So one of the ways that we do that at one screen is we have this amazing directory. We have this directory of these 10,000 different suppliers of the types of media that you may be looking at. So you can look at the city, you can look at what you're trying to achieve, you can look at the type of what you're trying to uh, advertise in, you know, the different types of venues, that sort of thing. So as you can see, there's a lot of ways to slice and dice. 
So let's look at New York City as an example. So in New York City, we know, for example, that there's you know a, a thousand ways to skin a cat. The first one, this is all reprise stuff. Corner of Macy's at 34th and 5th. Um, you can take a look at the different uh, advertising efforts. These were digital, so they kept rotating, and they had 100% share of voice on those particular screens. So in order to reach the audience, well, the subway takeover didn't make sense for them. Uh, bus tails didn't make sense for them. And blimps didn't make sense for them. But what did? It was the NASDAQ tower. And, and that's a peculiar product because if you ever look at, at that tower again and look at it, it's full of windows. It's all windows in that tower because it's an office building. And so you have to be careful when you're doing the creative in making sure that it, the creative is not being blocked by the opening of the actual windows themselves. So that makes it kind of exciting to be able to figure out what to do. But how we look at things, and this is for another client, is we look at where everybody resides and how do we find this out? through artificial intelligence, where we're looking at where are the population densities, then we overlay with what the, the actual um, Claritas has 62 different personas that you can take a look at, what, what are they doing, who they are, then you do an overlay of that, and then you pick, you pick the ones that are the likely places. Then you look at a map, this is all through AI, being able to figure out where should we be doing the buys? Where's the maximum buy? Because if you see something that goes one after another after another, you get that repetition of the brand messaging that people are going to see when they're driving, right? You're looking up. Hopefully, you're looking up and not looking at your phone and texting. Then you take a look at the type of the inventory that's available. And so this is 14 feet high by 48 feet long. These are big, big pieces of inventory. And then we have the ability to show the client where it's going to physically be located. And a lot of this is we have to show proof of performance. We have to make sure that, we, and this is one of the, the things that we provide is, after the event itself, after you've run your campaign, you want to be able to have a, what did it look like? Where did it go? That sort of thing. So then we also provide a lot of analysis about it. We look at foot traffic. This was for the LA uh, Clippers and we compared the results of pre and post and how many people saw the sign for the LA Clippers and how many people actually went to a game. And that was an important consideration for them. And then we take a look also at things like the impressions. How much did, how many impressions did you get? What was the cost of it? What did it look like in terms of a web lift? And then what exactly did you end up? And this was the, the game, the exposed uh, things, $25 per attendee to be able to buy a $150 ticket as a result was important for them. So these were some of the considerations and this is important. The most important thing that I, I can't get this across enough is when you're looking at a digital screen, we're all looking at this. We all know that there's three of Google ads here, 95 over on the left. Anytime that you're buying banners or any type of ad, you're in a cluster. With outdoor advertising, you have 100% share of voice when your ad is on the screen. Even if it's in a digital rotation of eight seconds every minute, you can still buy the entire minute if you want. Or when you're on the screen for eight seconds, it's all you 100%, which is a good way to be able to look at it. And then at conferences, advertising in airports has the highest perceived value for anybody trying to build their brand advertising in an airport, people, when they see an ad there or they see some sort of, um, you, you have all these kiosks, just look at all the opportunities that you have uh, with long dwell time in terms of being in an airport. You have lounges, you have all these opportunities to be able to reinforce your brand. Just next time you travel, <laughs> Take a look at all the opportunities you have. So one thing that we're looking to do with the, the Maycon event is being able to put advertising in baggage claim, being able to put advertising in the ride share that they, it's another 15 minutes via Uber or Lyft to get to the actual conference center, but looking for ways to be able to have that kind of promotion of the brand. And here's a good example for Reprise and what they did. They have a QR code. Uh, this was in baggage claim. 
they they ran it for a week. They started on the Saturday uh, when people were coming in, speakers, that sort of thing, into Phoenix Airport, all the way through the following Friday. Relatively low cost, but high visibility in terms of reinforcing their brand. Think, real and quick, why is this? So one thing again, if we have any event organizers on the call, you know, one thing that as an event organizer, I started thinking about with this is well, we should be bundling this with our media kit. So if, you know, if someone is going to be sponsoring Macon and they're looking at a bigger package of gold, a platinum, whatever, that it would be ideal if there was actually an option in there to say, hey, further activate this. We have yeah. you know, a partnership with one screen and here's how you can add on. And, and so you in essence have like the Cleveland inventory ready to go. And so just again, like I had never thought about this stuff. So if you're an event organizer <laughs> or if you're a sponsor of an event, yeah. you know, this is the kind of thing you can actually you know, go, go to market with now that maybe you didn't know like me before what was possible. Well, it's, it's not only what is possible because there's a land of possibilities out there. It's, 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 it's a kind of a challenge to do out of home. I know at Lola, we did buy some billboards in Boulder, Colorado, but we didn't do it well. We bought them ourselves. We did our own creative. They, they installed the vinyl. We did get proof of performance, but we weren't able to really measure any kind of results. A lot of marketers have bought out of home in some way or another. I just wasn't doing it right. I wasn't, I wasn't being effective. I wasn't augmenting a, a, another campaign. I, it wasn't part of a holistic effort to drive increased traffic, to be able to understand what your goals are. What are you trying to achieve? What, what is it that you want from this relationship? And this was an interesting study that just came out from uh, the LinkedIn B2B Institute, where the, they, they said that so many messages that we're constantly marketing on a B2B basis, whether it's software and it's big software, Prashant's here and he was with Comundo for a while and they had their software is $100,000 plus. And it's nothing that somebody's just going to buy and test. I mean, there is no freemium, right? So nobody is in the market. 95% of your customers are not in the market at any given time. And so we're not looking at things for the long term. And this is where the outdoor component can really reinforce messaging or get people to think about the visual. We have a tendency to block out a lot of our digital advertising efforts right now, yet by using out of home in a constructive way, it's gonna reinforce your brand over the long term because that's really what we need to be able to think about. We need to be able to reinforce when people are coming into the market. And this is where that consistency about marketing campaigns and your creative becomes so key, being able to make sure that you're mapping your colors, mapping your messaging, mapping everything over the long haul so that years from now, which it may be to be able to make sure that people are realizing how important it is, the power of the brand. B2B marketers, we're, we're really kind of stuck on short-term gains. We have salespeople that are screaming for leads and they and the leads they get inevitably are not perfect. They don't come with a PO attached to them. So people get a little bit, uh, the, the marketers are always on the, the hook to be able to provide this. Yet if we could start thinking longer term, you have short-term programs, you have medium-term programs, and you have long-term programs. This definitely falls into maybe the bottom of the funnel in terms of reinforcing your brand value, but it gives you a way to really stand out. And your salespeople generally really like this. So overall, just pointing out that out of home is not just a nice to ha have anymore. It's an important piece of your marketing strategy. And we want to be able to help you stand out. We want you to stand out from the crowd in this regard. And we're going to be able to help Macon and anybody else that would like some help. Thank you, Jean. And we're going to, we have time for questions. So if you have questions, we've had a couple in here already, um, but if you have any questions, go ahead and throw them in the Q and a or in the chat. Um, the first, we, so, okay, we got one about the difference between, uh, now I'm going to say it wrong, reprise, right? Reprise. Reprise. <laughs> Advert, and the conventional outdoor ads that have always been around, is it that AI chooses what is able to capture more people? Um, so just like, I, I think you kind of talked a little bit about almost that one-off, I'm going to go buy a couple billboards, I'm going to go to that vendor, get the billboards, 
versus this approach and how reprise used one screen just how do you how do you look at the difference and the ai stuff about like the tracking i could explain a little bit more but um how do you look at the difference between what traditionally would be done and, and what they're doing now well i think you know when you think about traditional there's traditional static types of inventory. So that's a static billboard that you have 100% share of voice for four weeks with that particular space in, in the real world at that time. Reprise did use some static billboards over a four-week period. This was in November. Um, it was November 8th, I believe, through December 7th or 6th or something in that time frame in those three physical markets. But they also had digital, and we were able to rotate some of the digital. They had the NASDAQ tower for just under a week. They had other digital venues and we were testing different creative for them to ma maximize their demo requests because that was an important consideration for them. But they were also just trying to build the power of the brand in what they, they wanted people to try the product. So they wanted more demos. They wanted more visits to the website. So the digital component of what they were buying uh, was able to be... Um, uh, move. It was more of a video type of a component versus a static type of, a, of messaging that you would have with something like a pizza box or a wrapped truck, the things that are just standard. So I, I'm not sure I answered the question, Paul. I'm, I'm not sure I'm Yeah, asking. no, I, mean, I think it's a, I think it's a pretty, it's like a general question, just like, hey, the traditional approach versus how it's enabled, but it actually kind of works into it's a follow-up from Michael of what does one screen exactly do? So the, the okay, like I'm, I see there's a need, maybe I'm a larger enterprise, I have the budget for this kind of thing, maybe I'm getting some ideas in my mind. So yep. explain to us again, is, is one string a directory? Is it a gateway to connect all of these things? Is it a, a you know, consulting? Um, so if someone's ready to go, like <laughs> what, what does one screen enable within this equation? So right now we built the directory. So we have a directory, which is awesome. There's a number of directories out there and we're trying to get all these different uh, media suppliers under one roof, if you will. Uh, ultimately, the goal is to create a marketplace. And what we're doing is we're using um, our directory to be able to do RFPs with the media suppliers that are on it. We want more media suppliers, publishers to be able to list their inventory on the directory. We're offering sales enablement tools like such as an audience insight report for our publishers. We're off so the sales team. So here's your inventory. Here's what's near nearby. This is how you could possibly sell this particular inventory. That's on the supply side. On the demand side, at this particular point in time, we're more of a, let's call it a tech-enabled out-of-home agency with a number of out-of-home experts that provide the strategy and the media plans and the customer success components for marketers that are interested in growing their own out-of-home business. And to, you know, if you're, if you're more interested in that stuff, I mean, one, you can just reach out to one screen, but um, if Kathy wants to throw a link in now, it's Kathy, like reading my mind, Kathy and I are around each other too much. She's like, knows what I'm going to say before I say it. <laughs> so there's actually an AI in action. So what we do is we have this, this ongoing series of AI in action where we do an educational demo of AI tech. And we actually work with that, the, the vendors to go inside and, and see how it works, understand the inner works in the technology, but also learn about AI in the process. So we do have an event coming up with one screen. We're actually going to go on the other end of this and look at how the technology actually works and get into more specifics around the AI components of it. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, there's a free webinar coming up in May um, that you can join us for that. So and Tim um, is amazing. He's a, yeah, he's and a Tim's going to be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's see what other questions we have. If you have any other ones, let us know. I've got like two other quick ones here. Um, so kind of building on this, but if, if I want to go, is the best step just to go to the one screen site, find somebody and say, okay, I need to build a strategy for this. Can, would you help me do this? I mean, that's kind of where you start. You could reach out to me on LinkedIn if you if you wanted the one on one type of a thing, and I'll I'll hand you over to the awesome team to be able to make this happen and happen well. Uh, you can always fill out the form. Uh, of course, there's a number of, of ways to uh, let us help you. 
uh, fully recognizing that at any given time, only 5% of you are going to be in the market to be able to do something. But it's always a good idea to kind of think and learn more. So you're not at an event. I think we, we always need to think about that you probably want to have at least four weeks before you're doing an event. That's why we're thinking about the August event in Cleveland now. It's not really something that you can do last minute. It, certainly there are digital components that you can do, but you really want to be able to plan it out and figure out what your goals, what your objectives are, and what, you know, results are you looking for from your individual campaign, and we can help you plan it out. For anybody on the coast, not an event organizer or sponsor of events, are there other personas that you work with commonly or others, you know, other elements of marketing where this strategy comes into play that you target? Well, a good example is there's a company called Carrot, K-A-R-A-T, and they developed a credit card for creators and all their creators are 20 years old, right? Yeah. All these influencers and everything. And so the idea is they use the credit card to be able to help fund what they're doing. And this is a very targeted audience that they went after. Well, they wanted to be have the way to be able to uh, reinforce their creative community, the influencers that they have. So they ran a contest where somebody that was using the carrot credit card would actually get a billboard on Grauman's Chinese Theater in um, LA, right? And so <laughs> they did it. And it was such a big hit that they said, we got to do more. So they did more. And then we did more. We did them in Times Square and, and people were flying into Times Square and getting their pictures taken. So it just it one after another, after another. And then everybody that was using the card or was an influencer of any shape or size all went and wanted to be able to have that visibility. So it was a relatively small, lower cost campaign because it was sort of like this is the day that it's going to happen. And this may be the hour that on the rotation that it's happening. But if you look at the social media following for that, they had so many people that were so excited about being seen on a billboard in either in LA or in uh, Times Square that it was pretty exciting. But for much, much smaller businesses, it's easy to work locally. Uh, there's a amazing amount of out of home vendors that are out there that are local. So if you're a real estate firm, or you're a lawyer, or you're looking, maybe you're a bug company or something that it's easy to go local. We have a tendency to do larger campaigns that are cross promotional that you're looking for that consistency of the creative and the messaging. And we're able to find those resources for you. When you go out on your own and you're looking to spend $50,000 or $100,000, it becomes so overwhelming that it's, it's very difficult to pull together all the back end with all the different formats and the different creative alone to be able to make sure and your creative that you use for outdoor out of home real world advertising is much different than what you would use on a, a banner ad or something it's got to be few words six words or less some of you are going to see some ads on the on your drive home and you're going to see a lot of things that are way too much stuff. There's just way too much. You can't focus on anything when you're zipping on the highway at, and you may be seeing this for six seconds or three seconds. And so you want to be able to make sure your message is tight, that you do have some repetition. And that's what we advocate for is the repetition of the messaging in an outdoor environment. All right, we got two, two other, we'll make these quick and then we'll, we'll wrap. So the first one I think is a really quick answer. Uh, can you deploy globally? So just what markets are being covered currently within the one screen directory? United States uh, okay. right now. And then uh, London is a, another one. So full story is looking to do um, an announcement in London. And so we're looking at Piccadilly Circus for them as an That's example. Awesome. Okay. Uh, but and we will go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. That's it. So US uh, and London right now. <laughs> Yeah, right now. Yes. Okay. This one might not be as quick, but we'll, we'll just, we'll, we'll address it a little bit and maybe we'll I'll come back around on AI in action on this one or Prashant has an issue. Okay. Does Prashant the measurement has all the answers. <laughs> My wingman. <laughs> does the measurement of out-of-home fall under the same scrutiny of regulators for privacy and other data requirements? So I, I don't know if like, again, we're not thinking GDPR here because it wouldn't be the same. You're not opting in. It's, it's, you know, you, you're being exposed, but 
Um, is there anything we can talk around on the privacy of the data, how you're targeting people or anything that might be relevant to this question contextually? Well, you know, if you, you asked me yesterday if I'd seen that John Oliver uh, yes. thing on data and I did watch it last night. It was crazy, isn't it? Is it crazy? Absolutely crazy. If you haven't seen it, you got to watch John Cap Oliver. Kathy can throw that link in. It's, it's worth the 25 brokers. minutes. It is. It's definitely worth it. And what I can say is that all of our information is aggregated. Uh, we are protected um, from PII. We, we were fully aware that there's ways that you can integrate all this information. And if you watch that thing from John Oliver, you'll see that there's ways to glue together 15 demographic patterns to be able to figure out who's who and what's what. But what, the way we look at that data in terms of foot traffic or any types of traffic going by, it's an aggregate. It's not individualized. Uh, we're not tracking you. I'm not tracking you, Paul, <laughs> as you go he, from He's at the turnstile. He's got in his suitcase. Turn the ad on <laughs> as he walks out. <laughs> there he goes. Um, <laughs> he's going to Starbucks. No, it's it, but we can look in aggregate and say people of this demographic profile are likely to do this or likely to do that. And it's it's more a matter of kind of looking at those Clarita 62 different types of personas and kind of break down. That's something that John Oliver said is that these are people and they're they're bands, they're aggregate. You know, it's like, you know, I drove a Volvo wagon when I was 16 because that was my grandparents' car, but I wasn't married with 3.2 children, but that that was my first car was a Volvo station wagon. It was navy blue, by the way. And uh, <laughs> I had a baby blue. A really cool wagon. car for a 16-year-old, let me tell you. So, but the, the point is, is that I wouldn't fit that type of persona, right? So everybody has different personas, but there's all variations on a theme. And when you're looking at your persona, you, you do have certain age types, you do have certain demographic profiles, but we're not looking at people. We're not looking at Paul. We're not looking at Kathy. We're not looking at Prashant. We're looking at aggregates. So that's just a way, it, because it's almost impossible to, I mean, unlike what you do on a digital screen, where Google is tracking you with cookies and that sort of thing. We're not able to do that right now. And, and Prashant, there are no GDPR type restrictions. However, your type of business and ad can have requirements if you're advertising tobacco, cannabis, gambling, regulated industries, et cetera, which you're going to be, you know, have to address anyway. So, yeah. well, this has been awesome. Gene, we'll have to do it again soon. <laughs> we'll do it in August. Um, make God, but thank you so much. And we will, this will be available on demand. So if you're, um, you know, that's always a question we get, didn't pop up yet, but yes, it'll be available on demand. We'll send out an email to everyone that registered, um, with access to it. And, um, yeah, we'll be back again in, in May. So look, I, God, that's only in like two weeks or May. Oh, I know Easter Moving Passover. Fast. It's right, I know. right now. <laughs> All right. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Gene. Thank you. One screen. Thanks. And I uh, will do it everybody. again soon.